In 40k, almost all of the races have a beginning point. A point where their story in the setting really begins for the average lore enjoyer. For example, the Eldari and Dark Eldari have the creation of Slanesh. The Necrons have their biotransference from organic to metallic. The humans have the founding of the Imperium. And the Tyranids have the first Tyrannic War. The time where the first real Tyranid presence could be felt in the Milky Way galaxy. Like the other examples, the beginning of the Tyranids in the galaxy is a violent one, filled with heartbreak, heroism, fighting against all odds, and great sacrifice. Just only on the Imperium side. Today, we'll go over the First Tyrannic War, which saw the High Fleet Behemoth plunge deep into the heart of the Realm of Ultramar, attacking and consuming many of their outer worlds, completely consuming one of the wonders of the Imperium of Man, and attacking the heart of Ultramar itself, McCrag. First, let's talk about the belligerence of this war of epic scale. And because I'm biased for the Tyranids, let's start with them. The Hive Fleet given the name Behemoth was a massive group of hundreds of thousands of individual Hive ships, with the biggest ones holding many millions of Tyranid bioforms each, making the fighting force of the Swarm a scale that is uncountable and near insurmountable for any defender. The fleet was also covered in a thick blanket of living spore mines that covered the entire fleet. This and the sheer amount of Tyranid ships in the fleet made it look like a huge cloud of things in space more akin to a gas cloud than an invading fleet. This effect also effectively hid the High Fleet from the Imperial sensors and observation craft, physically blocking the Imperials' efforts to see the fleet from far away. In fact, the spore mine blanket was so dense that even planets that were under siege from the fleet didn't truly know how big the fleet was until the blanket was breached. But for you to truly understand the size of this fleet and just how many spore mines are around them, let me add numbers to my description. High Fleet Behemoth had hundreds of thousands of ships in its fleet, ranging from ships inconceivable in scale to ships no bigger than picket ships, and innumerable strike craft, all being covered in a flick blanket of living spore mines of various sizes as well. It would take billions, if not trillions of spore mines to cover the fleet enough to be basically a stealth field and shield for the entire fleet. All in all, a horrific sight for any Imperial world to witness. But despite its name, Behemoth is not the biggest high fleet to engage the Imperium of Man. Leviathan takes that title, but it's the third fleet to enter the Milky Way galaxy and not the topic at hand. Behemoth did do one thing that no other high fleet of its size did, however. It concentrated its forces into a single unstoppable wave. Most Hive fleets that come after Behemoth spread out its massive fleet to attack many targets at once, but Behemoth attacked in a straight line, concentrating all its might into one system at a time, completely devouring it, and moving on with no regard to strategy or tactics, eventually falling upon Ultramar and the Ultramarine's homeworld, the first real resistance it faced. But the other belligerent of the First Tyrannic War are the Ultramarines and their homeworld of McCrag. And they are no weaklings either. In fact, Behemoth attacked one of the most heavily defended locations in the Imperium, and one of the only locations in that area that can call for massive amounts of reinforcements at a moment's notice and receive them in a timely manner. The planet McCrag had dozens of warships in orbit, Space Marine and Imperial Navy of all sizes, and had just as many highly impressive orbital defense stations scattered about the planet by the time the Tyranids reached the system. The planet itself was highly defended, as all important Imperial worlds are, with millions of PDF and Guardsmen on the planet, manning heavily fortified bunker systems that go all across the planet. But the most defended and formidable fortifications on the planet were the massive fortresses on both ice caps of the planet and the fortress monastery of the Ultramarines themselves, the Fortress of Hera. These three fortresses were the main focal points of the Battle of McCrag, and without them, this would have not been a battle at all. The planet also had numerous anti-ship batteries on its surface, being able to put down a conventional enemy fleet if needed, and this was only helped by one of the key defenders the Imperials had on their side, the mighty Titan Legion Legio Praetor. These god machines held entire battle lines by themselves and fought with such ferocity that the hive mind had to physically pull them down with the sheer numbers to end their calculated rampages. Another key defender was the Ultramarines chapter themselves. 
being one of the most well-disciplined chapters in the Imperium, and defending their very home, the whole chapter took part in the fighting, with them calling back as many of their battle brothers from abroad as they could before the behemoth arrived. But the most important focal point of defense of the planet was the man behind the defenses, the one whose genius made the impossible happen. Marnius Calgar, the chapter master of the Ultramarines. It was only his strategies that made the chapter survive, and while he made some mistakes, all would have been lost without him. But while the epic climax of the First Tyrannic War was the Battle of McCrag, it did not start there. It started on the ocean world of Tyran, far in the reaches of the galaxy's untamed eastern fringe. It wasn't a highly populated world, it was just a research station, but a valued research station, so its garrison was sizable for its size. It boasted four entire planetary defense lasers, an entire regiment of the Imperial Guard, three full wings of Thunderhawk gunships, a bodyguard unit for, of Skatari for the Mechanicus commander, and three whole light cruisers in orbit. The fortifications were also very in-depth. The whole outpost was stationed in the ancient depths of a group of dead volcanic islands. It was covered in an in-depth web of interception emplacements for repelling enemies from landing troops directly onto the outpost, and the outpost itself was an even bigger and more complex web of bunkers and defendable locations, all with the goal of giving the utmost benefit for the defenders. And this was not for no reason. For Xeno raids were common for outposts so far away from any potential reinforcements, and the ocean world itself was home to monsters of the depths, predators of all sides who regularly launched attacks upon the outpost. But none of these formidable defenses were built nor tested to fight against the Tyranids. But at this time, the Imperium had no idea what the Tyranids were, nor the threat they posed. But the outpost of Tyran did get some hints. Dead worlds. Dead worlds everywhere. Worlds that once had every manner of plant and animal life were stripped bare, and at alarming frequency. And when I say bare, I mean bare. There was nothing left of these planets. Not a plant, animal, or even a single bacteria was alive. They were reduced to floating rocks in space, where a once vibrant ecosystem was. First, only a couple were found, but as the decades went by, the number of dead planets in the eastern fringe were extremely high, and every time a new dead world was found, it would be relayed to the outpost on Tyran, which then sent its findings to the Explorator General in the Administratum. However, no follow-up was ordered, and the reports of new dead worlds near Tyran kept coming. What the Imperials didn't know at the time was that the cause of these dead worlds were, and as you could guess, it was High Fleet Behemoth. It arrived in the Milky Way galaxy after dormantly moving through the deep voids between galaxies, and when it awoke, it was quite weak. These dead worlds were the behemoth feasting, regaining its strength to create and restore its bioforms. And when it was ready, it aimed its sight at the nearest sentient biomass, the Tyran outpost. The Tyranids fell upon the outpost and washed over it in a tide of teeth and blade, pulling apart its layers of defenses by using the Mechanicus commander's misplaced faith in his mental superiority to pull him into traps in misdirection. The outpost fought bravely, but it was doomed. It was such a one-sided fight that the commander, upon realizing his defeat, ordered all the information of the invaders be stored into a data codex and sending it down into the depths of his once impregnable outpost. He died soon after sending the information to safety. But if he had not done that last act before his death, it is highly likely that Behemoth would have devoured the Ultramarine's home world and much, if not all, of the 500 worlds. One standard Terran year later, an Ordo Xenos Inquisitor would arrive on Tyran and discover its fate. The planet had been entirely stripped. The once thriving ocean world was a bare and dry dead world, for even the water was taken by the High Fleet. This Inquisitor was named Phidias Kripman, and he delved down in search of the data codex of the trampled outposts to glean what had happened to Tyran. And what he found was enough to make him dedicate his life to fighting the Tyranids wherever they appeared, and caused him to approve some of the biggest atrocities the Imperium ever did to its own citizens in its history. For he saw a tide of horrors from beyond the void, 
endless chittering monstrosities of all sizes and shapes, uncaring about its losses, moving with a coordination to rival Aldari hosts, and what happens when they win. He saw a new alpha predator enter the galactic stage, and he knew in his gut that unless the Imperium knew of what they were up against, it would have no chance. So, with his knowledge, he rushed back towards the Imperium, desperate to warn them of the coming danger. But he was a bit too late, for by the time the Inquisitor had landed on Tyran, Behemoth had not just stopped moving, it was plowing through the galaxy with no real thought or plan, ripping through system after system consuming everything in its path. Be it orc pirate fleets, renegade Astarte homeworlds, or massive bio-artifacts in the Imperium had manned for 9,000 years, nothing was able to stand up to the swarm. But even after finding the wreckage of all this, and countless more worlds stripped bare of all life, Cryptman hoped that the Imperial world of Thandros was at least still fighting when he arrived. But he was far too late. It was also stripped bare. Having spent every last bullet, and burned out its defense laser crystal, it put up quite the fight. But Thandros was not as heavily reinforced as Tyran, so even with the valiant struggle of its defenders, it was doomed. But Cryptman could not just give up on warning the Imperium, for during his travels from Tyran, he had followed the High Fleet's advance of destruction, and had plotted where the High Fleet would arrive next, the closest force that could drive back these void-born horrors the realm of Ultramar. And if they weren't warned ahead of time, Cryptman feared the worst could happen. Now, you might be asking, why didn't Cryptman send a message through his astropath? He clearly had one, because he was the captain of a ship. Well, that is because the warp is in an utter mess around a high fleet. The phenomenon is called the shadow in the warp, and it makes even using warp-based abilities almost impossible let alone such a complex and intensive procedure as sending a warning across the stars in a timely fashion. So Cryptman had to look for a way to boost his warp signal, you could say, and the closest booster was the Telepathica booster matrix on Dandros. With that, he could just maybe break through the High Fleet's warp interference and get the warning to the Imperium. But when he arrived, like I said before, Dandros was a dead world stripped of everything even remotely useful to the High Fleet. But the Telepathica booster matrix was extremely luckily and almost one piece, and as fast as they could, Cryptman and his agents salvaged what they could and got the massive machine working. And with a massive effort, enough to shatter his very soul, the astropath, with blood freely running from his ears and nose, broadcast Cryptman's warning. And by some miracle, a voice answered. A voice belonging to the very people they wanted to warn so desperately. A voice from McCrag. Upon delivering his warning, Crippen left to head to Ultramar and speak with the Ultramarines chapter master himself about what he had witnessed. And it was good that McCrag was seemingly taking his warning with the seriousness it deserved. By some miracle, Crippen made it to Ultramar before the High Fleet, and was able to speak with Marnius Kalgar in time to explain in detail just what was approaching Ultramar. The meeting was memorable to say the least. It was held in front of Kalgar's white marble palace, and Cryptman explained everything he had seen. Throughout it all, Kalgar was in rapt attention, learning everything he possibly could about the foe, and never letting his emotions slip even when mortals would become terrified at the story Cryptman told. When the explanation was finished, Kalgar immediately put his plan into action. He had triangulated what that the system the High Fleet would attack next was the McCrag system, and called forth every reinforcement he could think of, from both the Ultramarine successor chapters and the Imperial Navy. And as soon as the requests were sent, Caligar sent the Ultramarine's fleet to stop the fast approaching Xenos at the Garden World of Prandium. This planet was known as the Jewel of Ultramar, as its gardens and forests were bioengineered to such a master's degree that it was almost hypnotizing to those who looked upon it, and was regarded with such love that it was known as one of the wonders of the Imperium, and it was right in the path of the Behemoth. When the Tyranids arrived in system, they gunned right for Prandium like Kalgar had anticipated, and the might of the Ultramarines fleet were there to stop them, hold them at bay until reinforcements arrived from out of system and they could cleanly destroy the invaders. But that is not what happened. Instead, it was a complete disaster. The strategies the Codex Astartes taught were incredibly ineffective in fighting the Tyranids. The bleeding strategies it taught were ineffective at doing enough damage to matter, and did not affect the enemy's morale at all. 
The close range flyby attacks of their Thunderhawks proved perfect for the Tyranids, as they needed to get close to use their own artillery and longer range bio horrors, ripping apart many Thunderhawks as each flyby occurred. It was such a horrific defeat that the Ultramarines had to sacrifice not only Prandium, but the planet Kalth too, both devoured by the swarm as the survivors of the Ultramarines fleet returned to McCrag. The Ultramarines had failed in the defense of a much beloved world, and Calgar spent an entire week without food nor water, meditating on his error and how he will proceed. For it must have been quite the shock for the Ultramarines that their own Primarch's Codex's Stardes had failed them so spectacularly. For out of all Space Marines, the Ultramarines speak of the book with a reverence that is the same tone as the most pious zealot priest of the Emperor would use when talking about the Emperor. But upon leaving his self-imposed isolation, Calgar revealed his findings to his chapter. He had found that the Ultramarines chapter had been guilty of pride and had become complacent, relying wholeheartedly on a book from millennia prior to fight today's wars, and that was a grave mistake. He decided that while the Codex Astartes was indeed a genius book of tactics and learning, it could not perfectly teach all the new threats the Imperium would face in its long life. And so, the Ultramarines would have to think up new strategies and tactics to face the Tyranid threat. Let's be honest here, almost every other chapter already knew this lesson. However, for the Ultramarines to admit that their own father's teachings that got them through countless dire battles needed updates was an incredible chapter development. And such, harrying tactics were entirely abandoned, and the Ultramarines switched to a more Imperial Fist style of defense. Concentrated, overwhelming defense and a select number of vital locations, all centralized on a single defensive point. And the point the Ultramarines chose for their valiant stand? The Fortress of Hera. The Ultramarines had chosen their fortress monastery, the very heart of Ultramar, to be the heart of their defense. The Behemoth arrived in force over the world of McCrag. Millions upon millions of drop pod-like spores rained down upon the heart of Gilliman's legacy. But McCrag wasn't just going to let the Tyranids drop their troops on their fortifications without a fight, and while millions of the spores were destroyed in orbit by the thousands of anti-air firepower on McCrag, many more spores reached the surface, ejecting biohorrors of every size and shape onto the capital world. The battle was relentless and horrific. Millions of Tyranid bioforms swarmed over the lands, and in quick response, Calgar saw that this invasion could not be fought in piecemeal fashion, but needed a much more blunt weapon to crush the swarming Tyranids. He created three massive armies encompassing the vast majority of McCrag's planetary military might, his main and two supporting forces. The supporting forces were filled with First Company veterans and masses of the PDF, and were sent to reinforce the polar fortresses that were holding back a massively large force of Tyranids each. His main force, however, was for rearguard actions, trying to slow down the Tyranid advance and target vital links in the Tyranid chain of command, seeking and destroying what made the swarm so deadly in the first place, its unity. These strategies worked to great extent, and Calgar slowed the Tyranid advance enough to keep the Polar Fortresses and the Fortress of Hera from being overwhelmed. And what a toll the Polar Fortresses reaped upon the invaders. The Northern Bastion was surrounded by the Tyranids dead ten bodies deep. It was such a clogging of bodies that if you were there, you would have had to walk over the dead instead of the ground. But the Tyranids never stopped coming, and not all was sunshine and rainbows. Time was running out for Calgar. While his delaying actions and rearguard attacks had done great work on slowing the Tyranid advance, making the Tyranids pay dearly for every acre of land Calgar left them, it was not going to stop the invasion. And while Calgar was dealing with the swarm above ground, the hive mind was seeding more dangers below. As Calgar retreated more north, the hive mind sprung its attack. Hundreds of gene stealers erupted from the sewer systems of a vital starport for Calgar's defense, the Sirocco starport. This starport was thought to be safely behind friendly lines, and was the major hub for Caligar's shuttle fleet. But the Hivemind attacked without warning, and killed many pilots and Imperial defenders before a proper defense could be made. This surprise attack made Caligar not have enough transport shuttles for the PDF, meaning the mortal Imperial defenders would be without timely reinforcements or supply. This, although thankfully for Caligar, did not affect the Ultramarines, for he still had enough Thunderhawks to effectively move his Space Marines around, but nevertheless, this added another strain on the already strained-to-the-limit Imperials. 
However, the vast majority of Kalgor's forces, his guard and PDF forces, could only barely move with him. And with his time running short, he made a decision. He would make a stand with all the forces he could manage on Cold Steel Ridge, hoping to destroy the main force of the invading Tyranids at a place of his choosing with enough reinforcements to give him even the slightest advantage. But the Hive Mind was not a dumb thing. It was learning, and it had clashed with Kalgar's forces many times at this point, and had grown to know how the Chapter Master played war. And in recognizing that if the Chapter Master fell, the world was theirs, the Hive Mind deployed their greatest weapon, a Hive Tyrant the likes of which Kalgar had never seen before, the Swarm Lord. The Swarm Lord was the one who destroyed both Tyran and Thandros, learning how its new prey fought and what strategies best fit for their destruction. And it was seen on Cold Steel Ridge just how much the Swarm Lord had learned. As soon as the Swarm Lord arrived, the defenders noticed the swarm change. Where there once was only savage animalistic fury, now there was cunning. Their eyes were less ravening and more intelligent. And soon, Caligar saw the Swarm Lord's plan start to unfold. Using the defender's expectations of how the swarm used to fight, unthinking and simple, the Swarm Lord sent a Carnifex brood to the eastern flank of Calgar's lines. This in turn led Calgar to lead a counterattack to fend off these brutes. But when he did, a force of 10,000 Trigon and Raveners burst from the frozen earth in and amongst the trench lines of Calgar's battle lines, cutting off the Chapter Master and his counterattacking force from the trenches. By the time Calgar cut through the digging horrors, the trenches were nothing more than a graveyard overflowing with Tyranids. The Ultramarines purged the trench lines with flames as quickly as they could to get the eastern part of the trench lines back into Imperial hands, but in doing so, fell right into the Swarm Lord's plan. They exposed its real target, the massive battle tank the Pride of Hera, a bane blade that was holding the entire western flank solid against the Tyranid assault, alone, without infantry support. So the Swarm Lord sent a wave of Carnifexes to crash against the mobile bastion and ripped it apart. And with its destruction, Caligar's west flank was doomed. Over the next couple hours, it was a living hell for the Imperials. Every time Calgar thought up a strategy, the Swarm Lord immediately countered, turning the tide back into its favor. The Imperials fell by the hundreds, Space Marine and Mortal alike, till eventually the Swarm Lord screeched a challenge to Calgar himself and charged with a cohort of Tyrant Guard and warriors towards the Chapter Master's position. This might be seen as a foolish plan on behalf of the Swarm Lord, for Calgar was surrounded by elite Ultramarine veterans, but it had a plan. As Space Marines launched themselves to aid their Lord, the Swarm Lord countered with a horde of Hormigons that were hidden within their dead comrades to delay the reinforcements and keep their Lord alone. Calgar was known to be an amazing melee combatant, leading from the front and never fearing any foe, but he was outmatched in melee combat versus the Swarm Lord a being with untold thousands of years of swordsmanship experience, and now, with only his honor guard by his side, he could not avoid the Swarm Lord and his cohort. He fought bravely, knowing that if he could destroy this monstrous Hive Tyrant, he could revert the Swarm to its much more manageable state, Feral. But he couldn't. His armor was ripped apart, his mind and body on the brink of collapse. If it wasn't for Caligar's honor guard, he would be biomass for the Hive fleet as we speak. They fought off the Swarm Lord with the fury only bodyguards can when their lord is in mortal danger. By the grace of the Emperor, when Calgar was within Death's door, the Thunderhawks that were called from orbit arrived, blasting apart thousands of Tyranids as their wings strafed the Tyranid lines, giving the Imperials breathing room and allowing survivors of the battle to be brought off-world and rescued. The Swarm Lord wasn't just going to let his quarry escape, however, and attacked with his Tyrant Guard even harder to reach the Chapter Master's almost lifeless body. It took the combined effort of one of his Honor Guard's greatest, and the unrelenting attacks from the Thunderhawks that allowed Calgar to escape to the relative safety of orbit. But now, McCrag's major army on the planet was destroyed, and the Polar Fortresses were now alone, with no hope of reinforcement. In orbit, there was a whole new set of problems. Mainly, it was going horribly for the Imperials. The Hive Mind had used comparatively advanced tactics in the naval battle than the ground battles. They had targeted key points in the Imperials' defensive lines and destroyed them. Case in point, 
The first wave of Tyranid Voidborn monstrosities had eliminated the mighty ultramarine battle barge, the Caesar, leaving a massive gap in the Imperials' defense. The Imperials tried to cover the gap, and did so for one additional wave, but at the third wave, the Tyranids got through, devouring and destroying a large portion of the Macragian merchant fleet. By the ninth wave, the Tyranids had turned the impregnable Void Star Nova Bastions into meat processing plants, spinning in their orbits like lifeless insults to the Imperials, further cracking open the Macragian defense. And finally, by the twelfth wave, there was almost zero orbital defenses remaining, either on the ground or orbit, and the defense fleet was almost in total ruins as well. Macrag lay almost undefended and ripe for consumption. And to that effort, the hive ships spread out, covering the planet in a wave, and dropping untold thousands of drop pod spores directly onto the last remaining Imperial resistances on Macrag. And the polar fortresses got hit particularly hard. But the space battle was not over yet. Manny's Kalgar was not dead, and now he was in orbit. He refused almost all medical aid and went immediately to reorganizing the wounded Imperial fleet, and started harrying the Hive ships as they spread out to deploy their troops onto the surface. How much this did was undoubtedly little, but with their biohorror cargo depleted, the Hive ships retreated from a crag in an attempt to lure the defenders away from supporting the Polar Fortresses. Caligar took the bait, sending his fleet to chase the Tyranid bioships away from McCrag. He didn't do this because of a mistaken view of naval victory, he had a plan. And whatever that battle plan was, it was given major support, with the arrival of the full battle fleet Tempestus, arriving in perfect time to sandwich the Hive fleet between the two Imperial fleets. But even with this timely reinforcement, the Imperials were still heavily outnumbered and fighting on the back foot. For the Hive Fleet was just too massive for even the two fleets to face in open combat. The Hive Mind's victory was imminent. Crushing two massive fleets would make further battles much easier. But that is not what happened. Seeing the dire predicament McCrag was in, and the whole of the Imperium as well, the Imperial Navy Fleet gave the ultimate sacrifice. For in the massive Imperial Battle Fleet, there was a truly gargantuan Imperial vessel, the Dominus Astra. An Emperor-class battleship, one of the oldest and most heavily armed void ships the Imperium can produce. It launched itself into the very heart of the Tyranid High Fleet and overloaded its warp drive, detonating itself and causing a massive warp rift within the heart of the Tyranid Fleet. This sucked the vast majority of the High Fleet into the warp, leaving only a few on the edges of the portal in real space. The remaining Hive ships were now stuck in between two very angry Imperial fleets and were mercilessly obliterated. Only a couple battered and bleeding hive ships escaped the wrath of the Imperials into the void of space. With a heroic victory in space, the Imperials rushed towards McCrag to reinforce the polar fortresses and see if any still lived at all. When Caligar returned to McCrag, he saw total devastation. The Tyranids had swept over the planet's surface and reduced the once thriving planet to a oozing ruin and the polar fortresses were unpleasantly silent. Upon investigation of the northern polar fortress, survivors were found, hiding deep within the fortress, holding bastions with thousands of dead, both Imperial and Tyranid, clawing at the steel. But the fortress held. In the north, however, there were no survivors. Dead was heaped in layers six deep kilometers around it, and when exploring the vacant corridors and destroyed bastions of the fortress, one could see the battle's progress. Imperials dead in the jaws of massive bio-monstrosities, but seen with their daggers in the beast's hide. Space Marines only giving in and dying after every body part was removed by the Tyranids. Massive craters of where Titans once stood, now smoking or ravaged wrecks motionless in muddy trench lines. And at the very deepest point of the fortress, the remains of the veteran Terminators of the First Company, laying back to back in a circle. They fought to the last man, but the veteran first company of the Ultramarines was wiped out to a man. It took much longer for all the leftover Tyranid biohorrors to be wiped off the face of McCrag, but eventually it was completed. At the cost of almost the entire Ultramarine chapter and countless mortal lives, McCrag survived. And it will rebuild again, no matter how many decades it must take. And that's the story of the First Tyrannic War. 
the war that brought my favorite faction to 40k and brought the galaxy's biggest threat to the setting. Thanks for watching. Leave a like if you liked it and subscribe if you do.